Commercialization of herbal products and health foods in the United States is a multi-billion dollar industry with uh, lots of advocates and a, a growing power base uh, both locally at the grassroots level and nationally in Washington DC. Uh, this is part of a growing trend that's found all around the world and many people are excited to see this development while others are saddened to see this development. Uh, those who are excited see this as a shift in the way that uh, natural medicines are seen within the United States and they get excited about the idea that there might be more medicines on the horizon. Those that are not so happy with it uh, don't like the fact that it's becoming very commercialized and is becoming more and more like the pharmaceutical industry. Well, one of the key things that we want to point out to you today is that these herbal medicines that are increasingly all around us that are plant-based are in fact part of a cyclic process that has happened many, many times in the history of both the United States and Europe as well. The herbal and pharmaceutical industries in the United States share a common heritage, and this is going to be one of the themes that runs through this presentation. Most, man most pharmaceutical manufacturers of today were originally herbal extract producers. And many, many modern herbal manufacturers are rapidly becoming pharmaceutical manufacturers. All of this is part of a cycle that appears to be going through multiple iterations within the history of our country. Uh, traditional medicines in the United States have not really been lost, uh, but have instead been transformed into many of our modern pharmaceuticals. And in fact, there's some percentage, and people argue over what percent it is, of the modern pharmacopoeia or pharmaceuticals uh, that are actually derived from medicinal plants of the past. Fragments of traditional European and American herbalism have not been incorporated into pharmaceutical products because of a variety of issues often centered upon the complexity of pharmaceutical actions of the plants involved. And, and what this basically means is that although there's many traditional remedies from Europe and America that have been incorporated into the pharmaceutical industry, there's some of these that have not for complex reasons. There has always been an herbal products industry in the United States and in Europe, and in fact throughout the world, anywhere where people are selling traditional medicines, uh, those sales are really based upon herbal medicines. In the United States, these traditions in the 1800s uh, slowly evolved into uh, kind of more modern forms. What we have is that in the early part of the 1800s, people started to learn how to isolate the biologically active molecules in plants, and they started to purify these. At first, this meant that there were extracts that were made that had higher concentrations of those purified forms. Things such as laudanum, which was a purified form of opium, um, became a very popular product and was widely used. Uh, eventually, they learned how to isolate pure molecules, and so out of things like laudanum, we isolated morphine and codeine. And then they learned how to modify those molecules to make them even more biologically active, and we convert something such as morphine and codeine into molecules such as heroin and uh, uh, the other uh, narcotics that are now widely sold as uh, commercial pharmaceuticals. This process is a process that we see happening over and over throughout history. Much of the impetus for these kinds of changes has been demand of the public. And, and although the public of today has a, a strong motivation to have herbal medicines, actually the public of the past had a strong motivation to have medicines that were consistent, that were predictable. And as it turns out, as you purify a plant extract and slowly move towards a specific molecule, you increase the specificity of your product and you do make for a higher level of predictability. And so it was really demand of the public that led to the rise of the pharmaceutical industry. 
because it is this rise in uh, development of concentrated and purified forms of plants that is also the rise of the pharmaceutical industry in the United States and Europe. After a while, uh, producers actually even stopped labeling their products as being from plants. And we see pharmaceutical manufacturers who were selling uh, purified molecules alone. And these are drugs or pharmaceuticals. Um, and this is a process that continues to happen. Uh, for instance, in recent years, you've seen uh, herbal products manufacturers that have started to say on their labels that their particular plant that they're selling uh, has a certain percent of some active ingredient. So it could be, you know, a, a certain percentage of gensinicides, and that's why they claim that their product is very active. It's why they claim that their product is consistent. Uh, the implication being that their competitors are either less active or inconsistent in their product formulation. This rapidly leads to the next phase that we do see with some herbal products manufacturers of today, where they're marketing a greatly purified extract where it's clearly no longer the plant product um, and so they're wanting to sell you a purified product and this is just one step removed from a pharmaceutical. Um, as they do this the control over their product increases their ability to market that product uh, increases and they rapidly become another pharmaceutical company and so the conversion of herbal products companies into pharmaceutical companies is an ongoing process been happening since the 1800s and it continues to happen on a daily basis today. Well, what also happens on a daily basis is that filling in behind the herbal products industry are up and coming small industries of people who uh, don't like the big business feel, who want to make their own tinctures, they want to make their own capsules, they want to make their own herbal products and uh, so they come along and make those and they satisfy a market of people who are not interested uh, in these highly commercialized and uh, highly processed products. And so uh, the cycle continues. Uh, I'm now going to discuss a series of the most popular herbal products in the United States. Uh, most of these have large bodies of information about them, both about their traditional uses and their uses in modern society. And so we're just going to barely skim the surface. So if you hear me discuss one of your favorites and I don't talk about your favorite usage, that's okay. Uh, don't feel bad about that uh, because I haven't discussed most of the usages of these plants. For each of these, I want you to note the range of the plant families. So uh, we're going to look at a kind of a range of plants, but it turns out they're, they don't come from all plant families that are out there. Note the range of the plant parts that are being used. There's some parts of plants that are far more commonly used as medicines than others. Note the range of the cultural origins. The, the cultures from which these herbal remedies are derived are, are not from a, a cross-section of the world, but rather they're from specific groups of cultures, uh, probably cultures that have had traditional plant knowledge that parallels that of most Americans and Europeans, and therefore is more easily brought into American and European circles. Uh, note the kinds of uses that are given. I'm going to just provide the more generalized uses and not the specific ones. But look for the patterns of these. What are the kinds of ailments that these are used to treat? Are these the same kinds of ailments that uh, pharmaceuticals primarily treat? Or are these ailments that pharmaceuticals don't treat well? And note the level of knowledge that we have about the active constituents. Now for some of these we know literally thousands of chemicals that are found in each plant. Uh, but I'm going to talk about the, the molecules that are considered to be uh, the most important to people who are marketing these and using these. So we'll begin with aloe vera. Aloe vera is in a, uh, uh, the lily family. Uh, the leaf pulp is the primary part that's used of this plant, uh, with the roots and the flowers not being used very often. Uh, the plant is originally from sub-Saharan Africa and was used in also used in Coptic traditions in North Africa, uh, these being in the area of Egypt and Ethiopia. Some of the common uses include treatment of burns, skin blemishes, topical irritations, as an antibacterial and as a digestive aid. The active constituents include anthroquinones, anthrols, anthrones, and chrysophanic acid. 
For this plant, we actually know a fair amount of the chemistry, and we have a fairly good feel for how it works. Uh, among its most important modern uses are probably the treatment of burns, and in fact, this has expanded to treat uh, uh, not only sunburns, but also chemical burns and burns from radiation other than the sun. The, the next plant is bilberry. Uh, bilberry is in the Ericaceae family. This is the blueberry family. The primary parts that are used are the fruits. The bilberry comes out of British traditions and uh, ancient British traditional medicines. This is commonly used to treat poor night vision and poor adaptability to bright lights. Uh, prevention and treatment of diabetic retinopathy, antioxidant formation of collagen and connective tissues, strengthening capillaries and blood flow, and prevention of bruising, varicose veins, and hemorrhoids. The active constituents include uh, quinic acid and anthrocyanocytes, which are complex bioflavonones. Uh, bilberry was really popularized amongst Americans uh, after World War II, where in, uh, during the war, American pilots who were interacting with British pilots uh, learned about the use of bilberry. And the British pilots were eating bilberry in order to decrease night blindness. And so the American pilots picked up on this and then brought the idea back to America with them after the war. Next we have chamomile. Chamomile is a member of the Asteraceae, or the sunflower family. The primary parts that are used are the flowers, but actually all parts of the plant can be used. Originally, uh, chamomile is a Germanic traditional medicinal plant. It's applied externally for eczema and other inflammatory processes. It can be gargled as a treatment for mouth sores or canker sores, and it's taken internally for colic and restlessness in infants for ulcers and for irritable bowel syndrome. The active constituents include matricin, uh, a wide range of flavonoids, and volatile oils such as alpha bisabolol. Uh, this, is, this is a plant that's had a little bit of controversy around it as to whether it's effective or not, and some people have an idea that it may cause some kinds of cancer. Um, uh, in that regard, we have quite a few medicinal plants that have kind of a cloud that looms around them, and it's difficult to say whether this is true or not, um, but it's probably worth thinking about if you're planning on using them. The flip side of that is that most pharmaceuticals also have a cloud about them that relates to one or more potential problems that can happen in a small percent of the population. Probably the bottom line is that if you need to use a medication, um, whether it be a plant or a pharmaceutical, there's always the potential for some kind of side effects that may be undesirable. Cranberries are also in the, the, uh, the Ericaceae, the same as bilberry was. The same part that's used is the fruits. These originate in Eastern North American, Native American traditional medicines. They're primarily used to treat urinary tract infections. Uh, although there have been some publications in recent years about some of the active constituents, it's still controversial as to exactly what they are. Uh, however, there is very clear data to show that something in cranberries causes bacteria to not be able to stick to the walls of the bladder and the urethra, and therefore uh, cranberry juice is effective in the treatment of urinary tract infections. Echinacea is one of the most popular herbal products. Uh, in the United States, it's typically in the top five as far as sales go. Echinacea is also in the Asteraceae or the sunflower family. Uh, lots of different parts of the plant are used. Different herbalists will swear by roots or by tops, uh, all kinds of parts, uh, but we can consider that the entire plant is used. There's several different species that are used, and these are species both from North America and from Europe. Uh, the, the original cultures that were using these are those of Central North American uh, Native American traditions, and also some from Europe. Uh, the common uses are for prevention and treatment of viral, bacterial, and fungal infections, and as a general immune system stimulant. The principal active constituents are primarily chicoric acid and its derivatives. Evening primrose is in the Onagraceae, or the evening primrose family. Uh, the primary part that's used is the oil of, of seeds. Um, 
It's difficult to say what, if any, culture this particular practice derived from because there's not a strong tradition of usage of the seed oil, uh, particularly in the way that it's used today. The common uses include treatment of premenstrual syndrome and breast pain, uh, particularly cyclic breast pain that's associated with PMS. It's also used to treat eczema, where it's applied externally, and to treat rheumatoid arthritis, where it's taken internally, and to treat diabetic neuropathy. The active constituents include gamma-linolenic acid, and this is incorporated within prostaglandins and triglycerides and functionally shifts the arachidonic acid pathway uh, to provide a very clear pharmacological mechanism of action for this herbal product. Feverfew is an, a good example of a plant whose name gives you a good implication as to what it's good for. Feverfew is also in the Asteraceae, and it's the leaves that are primarily used. Uh, this particular plant's originally used in Mediterranean traditional medicine. It's used to treat migraine headaches, fevers. Imagine that. Feverfew is used to treat fevers. Um, and its act active constituents include parthenolides, which are uh, sesquiterpene lactones. And uh, this particular plant has some very good chemistry backing up why it would work. Garlic is probably the most popular medicinal plant and also medicinal food that's used all around the uh, temperate parts of the northern hemisphere. Uh, this is in the onion family, Aliaceae. The leaves and stems that are together are called a bulb is usually what's used. Uh, the original cultures are widespread across North Africa and Asia and includes Chinese, Coptic, Farsi, Mediterranean, and different Semitic traditional medicinal systems. The origins of this plant are so ancient, in fact, that this is one of the most commonly mentioned plants in ancient pharmacopoeia uh, from a wide range of cultures. Common uses include immunostimulation and augmentation of circulation. And in modern uh, uses, uh, the modification of triglyceride and cholesterol levels um, and in control of hypertension. The active constituents include allicin and allyl sulfides. And what's really fascinating is that these molecules are the same molecules that lead to the strong odor, that sulfury odor that we associate with garlic. What makes this so fascinating is that there's a wide range of products on the market that are sold as odorless garlic. Well, if the active constituents are the part that gives off an odor, it's rather baffling to consider how you could have an odorless garlic that is actually still effective. But who am I to argue with advertising? Ginger is another really important medicinal food uh, that we find being used almost strictly as a medicine in some societies and strictly as a food in others and as kind of some of each in many cultures. This is in the Zingiberaceae or the ginger family um, and it's the rhizome or underground stem which is primarily used as medicine. The original cultures that use this are in South and East Asia so including the areas of China and India and everything in between. The most common uses are as a digestive aid, as a carminative, or something that uh, takes care of gas, and to help deal with nausea and vomiting, and as an anti-inflammatory. The active constituents include gingerols and shogols, which are different kinds of volatile oils and are closely associated with the kinds of smells that we uh, pick up with gingers. Ginkgo is one of the more unusual medicinal plants in that it's a very large tree. Uh, most of the medicinal plants that we're looking at are actually small herbaceous plants or bushes. This one happens to be a tree. Uh, ginkgo is in a family of conifers that instead of having needles like most conifers we're familiar with, have wide leaves. So it's in the Ginkgoaceae family. It's the leaves that are primarily used as medicine and the traditional uses come out of China and Japan. The, the common uses today are for improving memory, to treat Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, for improved circulation, and post-stroke recovery. Uh, the active constituents are ginkolides and some different related flavonoids. Um, although there's a fair amount of literature and research that's been done on uh, ginkgo, 
uh, is rather controversial as to whether it is effective or not. Uh, where advocates come out with a number of studies that show that ginkgo does help improve memory and uh, bring, bring about positive results in some of the other ailments it's used for, whereas other studies show that it doesn't do anything. So I think the jury is still kind of out on ginkgo. Um, if you can remember to take it, you probably don't need it for your memory. Ginseng is probably the most important medicinal plant in the world, uh, being very widely used in Asia in particular. This is in the Aureliaceae family. It is the roots and rhizomes that are primarily used. Um, ginseng is used in a large number of cultures, particularly those of East Asia, China, Korea, and various parts of Siberia. Uh, but ginsengs are also used in North America, although different species than Panax ginseng. The most common uses are taking it internally to treat fatigue, to help with endurance and stress, and as a general immune system stimulant. The active constituents are ginsenicides, and in fact, this is one of these categories of medicines that has been purified down, and it's actually possible to go to a store and buy capsules of pure ginsenicides uh, that were either extracted from ginseng or were produced synthetically and are now being sold functionally as a pharmaceutical product. One of the interesting things about ginseng is that it's now being widely cultivated in tissue culture in Asia. And so what this means is that uh, the scientists have taken small cuttings of ginseng and have transferred them into a petri dish and have stimulated this tissue to grow without becoming a plant. And so it just kind of becomes a big blob of plant material. Now this blob of plant material still produces the ginsenicides and therefore has the active markers of ginseng. It doesn't look like a ginseng plant and actually if you were to look at the total chemical profile it doesn't look like ginseng at all. Uh, however, this is highly marketable and so they grind it up and sell it to people to put into capsules uh, or tinctures and so a lot of the ginseng that's on the market is actually not plants grown in the ground but is actually plants that have been grown in a laboratory. Golden seal has, has been popular in the past in the United States, but its popularity has dropped off quite a bit. Uh, and its popularity is kind of an interesting phenomenon. Golden seal is in the ranunculaceae, or buttercup family. Uh, That's the rhizomes that are primarily used. It's originally a uh, traditional medicine of native North Americans. Its common uses are to treat viral, bacterial, and fungal infections. It's used as an anti-diarrheal for immunostimulation, as an astringent to treat hypertension, uh, to treat coughs as an antitussive, and most importantly for detoxification. And it, it's this particular usage that really has popularized it in recent years where it is used as part of cocktails to help people who want to take a drug test pass their drug test. Now there's only minimal evidence that this is actually effective, but this has led to large sales of golden seal, and uh, particularly amongst people who are nervous that they might lose their job if they don't pass their drug test. So does that work? Well, I don't know. Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. Um, one of the problems with golden seal is that in some parts of its distribution in the United States, it's either endangered or has become quite rare. And so the wild harvesting of it for commercial sale uh, is actually having pretty negative impacts on the populations of the plant. The active constituents include berberine and berberine sulfate and hydrastine. And what's very interesting is that berberine and hydrastine are molecules that are found in a large number of other plants, uh, both plants in this particular family and plants in the bearberry family, the bearberry daceae. And, and so we see some of the same uses uh, taking place with plants in this other, uh, group, uh, other family. Milk thistle is in the Asteraceae family. It's the seeds that are primarily used. Um, this comes out of some Mediterranean traditions. The common uses are for treatment of hepatitis and various related liver diseases. The active constituents include uh, silymarin and silibinin, and a range of flavonoids that are endemic to these species. From a pharmacological perspective, it's difficult to say whether these remedies are actually effective. These are used as pharmaceutical products within parts of Europe, uh, but not within the United States. Um, some authors argue 
that this plant actually leads to more liver problems than it does treatment of liver problems. And so uh, before starting on the use of mint thistle, it's probably a good idea to read over the literature and make an informed decision. Saw palmetto is a, a plant that's risen in popularity in, in recent years and actually represents a very unusual kind of situation. Uh, this is a palm from the east coast of the United States. Uh, it was used by Native Americans as a food, but there's no evidence that it was actually used as a traditional medicine. Uh, currently, it's being used to treat benign prostatic hyperplasia and to treat chronic non-infected prostatitis. The active constituents include a complex range of fatty acids uh, that are somewhat unique to this particular plant. Siberian ginseng is another ginseng from Asia uh, that's related to Asian ginseng. Uh, it's also in the Aureliaceae and it's also the roots that are used. This is, comes out of Chinese traditional medicine and the traditions of peoples to the north of China. This is taken internally for fatigue, endurance, and stress, and as a general immune system stimulant. It has the same general active constituents as um, Asian ginseng, but also has uh, eleutherocytes, which are similar glycosides uh, that have similar properties to uh, uh, the ginsenicides that are found in uh, Asian ginseng. St. John's wort has been widely used as an alternative for pharmaceutical treatments of depression. St. John's wort is in the Clusiaceae family. Uh, it's the flowers and upper stems and leaves that are used medicinally. Uh, probably the earliest records of its usage in Europe, where it's a fairly widespread plant, are in Greece, where they record it very early on as being a medicinal plant. Its modern uses include the treatment of depression. It's also used as an antiviral agent. The active constituents include hypericin, and probably some other unknown molecules that both cause uh, that are both active and cause side effects that include monoamine oxidase inhibition, uh, which this means modifying the way that some enzymes in the body uh, process and eliminate other biologically active molecules. Valerian is another one of these top medicinal plants. It's in its own plant family. Uh, the roots are the primary part that's used, but people will argue about the usage of other parts of the plant as well. Valerian is used widely in different Mediterranean and European traditional medicines. Its primary usage is for sedation and to treat anxiety. The active constituents include actinidine and valerianic acid. Vitex is in the Verbenaceae family. Uh, this particular vitex or is also known as monk's chaste and was widely reported in uh, medieval Europe and is, is part of uh, a number of different Mediterranean traditional medicinal systems. The fruit are the primary part that's used. These are used to treat premenstrual syndromes, amenorrhea, dysmenorrhea, menopause, and infertility. But of course it's most most widely known for its traditional usage to help monks and other individuals who had a vow of chastity maintain their vow of chastity. In fact, some of the stories go that uh, Roman soldiers would give this to their wives when they went off to fight in war and they might be gone for years and their wives were presumably consuming this while the men were gone and would therefore maintain chastity for this soldier who was gone for years and years. The uh, active in constituents include some glycosides and uh, castasin. Just about every year there's a few new uh, herbal medicines that come onto the market. Some of these come on with a flash and, and lots of press and others kind of sneak in and we don't really realize they're there for many years. Um, for the most part these come onto the market and they don't really make enough sales for them to stay and then they leave. And it, it's sad to say that within the United States if a, an herbal product does not receive wide enough sales, uh, there's not the pressure for it to stay in the market, even though it might be useful and, and might ultimately develop some kind of a niche. At the same time, 
uh, there are some products that every once in a while sneak into the market uh, that are actually dangerous. Um, frankly, I think most herbal products are very safe and are perfectly useful. Uh, however, one of the things that we want to avoid is the notion that just because something is a natural product, just because it's a plant, uh, that it must be safe. The simple fact of the matter is, is that almost all poisons that are known are natural products that come from plants. So just because it's something natural doesn't mean that it's safe. However, being natural does tend to make things safe as a general rule of thumb. So you know, you kind of got to argue it both ways here. Uh, however, some people go a little overboard. Uh, one interesting case that happened a few years ago is the case of Laria. Uh, Laria is uh, the genus of the chaparral plants. Chaparral is an example of a plant where a mistake was made. Native Americans had traditionally used the leaves and pieces of the stem to treat topical skin infections and to treat skin tumors. This is reported in the anthropological literature. Uh, an herbal products company a few years ago uh, read the literature, realized that they were surrounded by chaparral where their company was located, and that, wow, they should be marketing this stuff. So they read the anthropological literature that said that this plant could be used to treat uh, uh, cancer or tumors, and they decided to make a product. They gr ground up a lot of laria, they put it into capsules, and they started marketing it. Well, after a short period of time, a large number of their customers who had consumed these capsules started having their liver fall apart and found themselves in the hospital with basically no liver function. And it turned out that Laria is really toxic to the liver. Well, it took a little rooting around by some ethnobotanists to discover that the Native Americans were never swallowing the leaves of this plant. Instead, they were preparing a paste and rubbing it onto skin tumors and treating the tumors that way. The company, after settling their lawsuits, reformulated their product and came out with a topical uh, product that could be applied to tumors on the skin. But th this is not an unusual problem that occurs. And it's a problem of misunderstanding going from one traditional view of how a medicine should be used and trying to just arbitrarily pull it into another view. And uh, this is probably not an uncommon problem uh, in the herbal products industry, and there's actually good reason to believe that many products that are sold today uh, are not used the way that they would have been used traditionally. Um, in Hawaii, a good example of this is clearly ava. Uh, ava is sold as capsules to be consumed. Uh, these capsules generally contain either dried powder or a concentrated extract, and the way that it's delivered and the dosage that's given is substantially different from the traditional dosage and what it's being used for is substantially different than the traditional usage. So this is probably not an uncommon phenomenon. What has happened is that within the United States the government has tried to regulate medicines and has tried to do so in a way that is if they error it's the error on the side of being overly protective. Uh, many consumers are not happy about this uh, but if they were to look back at the events in the 1920s and 30s when many of the snake oil salesmen were being shut down, they would understand why the uh, FDA and other government agencies are as overly protective as they are. It's considered to be better to prevent a perfectly good medicine from getting on the market than to allow a real nasty one to get out there and cause trouble. So in, in summary, I, I've only given you kind of the, the tip of the iceberg of the herbal products industry. There's lots of plants that are being used and in fact this is probably the aspect of our society where the most plants are being used around the world. It's estimated that there's more than 30,000 medicinal plants being used around the world and at any one time a pretty fair number of these are, are being sold commercially somewhere. Um, within the United States we only see a small fraction of those and of that well, it's only a small fraction that are actually used on a regular basis by the public. Next time you go into a, a herbal product store, a health food store, look around, try and look at the species diversity that's present. Think about the different plant parts that are used. Think about the cultures that donated these plants to you and the benefit that you get from those cultures. As you think about these things, I think you'll realize that we have a lot to thank people from different cultures 
for the kinds of plants that they've provided that are now all around us.